As I mentioned, this is our third evening. The uh, first two nights, I uh, took a, a bit of time to look at some words, uh, particularly uh, one, one night I spent a, a quite a bit of time on the uh, visitation that Bob Jones had on August 7th, 1975. Probably uh, one that he received more information than any other uh, experience he ever had. It was his very first one. And it was the, it's when it all began for him in the prophetic realm. And he began to see things about national and international things and the role of the Midwest, the role of Kansas City, and those kinds of things. And then I talked about Paul Kane and some of the big picture things that the Lord showed him about Europe and, uh, and uh, evil spreading and the, and, and the change that's happening. And I believe that we can't really understand our local mandate without understanding the global picture of what's happening, what the prophets are saying. And I've tried for years, uh, starting with the local mandate, to get people's hearts alive in it, and there's always a disconnect till they understand the big picture of what's going on. So tonight I'm going to uh, move in a little more personal. Here on the third session, we're going to have 12 evenings, Lord willing, uh, looking at uh, 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 sometimes overview, sometimes intimate part of the stories, and sometimes others in our midst uh, sharing some words uh, that are uh, like Elizabeth just shared a few minutes ago. I've been in St. Louis from age 20 to 27 for, for about seven years, and the Lord's going to begin to emphasize the relationship of the major regions within the Midwest to one another under the banner of prophetic and intercession and our role together before the whole earth. It's something that, again, that has been spoken uh, by a number of, uh, of prophetic voices a lot in the early days, and Bob Jones said it over and over and over. And, and, and I've, uh, I've pondered it, I've, perplexed, I've been perplexed over it, and so that's another uh, subject for another time, but I just want to kind of put that on the back burner because in the next season ahead of us, the Midwest flowing together as a prayer furnace under the unction of the prophetic, being a source of supply in the spirit, touching the world in a way that Bob Jones first received that back in 1975, and many have added to it. So I, I'm in St. Louis for seven years, and I, I was just recalling the, the sovereign things that happened. The Lord spoke in 1990 that he's raising up an international family of affection. He's looking for an international family of affection when it's all said and done. All uh, pulling together with one heart, the body of Christ across the earth. That's why when people start talking about <clears throat> something begins here or something begins there, and they have this preoccupation with biggest, best, and first. You know, who's the first one and where did this start and who's the biggest and who was the best and who's the first? It's a completely opposite spirit of where God's bringing the church into an international family of affection where we're laying our lives down for one another, being joints of supply on a global dimension under the leadership in this magnificent tapestry of the Holy Spirit that he's He's just weaving together. It's just, it, and as I've had the chance in the last 20 years to have real heart connect with different prophets in different nations, it's amazing to watch it come together. I bet, like I said, I've been reviewing all kinds of uh, different words from other places too and just going, Lord, this thing is becoming more beautiful. It, it, it is ordered and the picture is becoming clear. And again, I have no doubt the Lord's whispering. It seems a lot more clear than it used to, but you haven't even begun to see where this is going in clarity. So I'm in St. Louis seven years with a real sense of having been set there sovereignly. And again, I haven't told the story in this context. Sovereignly set there in a way uh, where uh, I couldn't imagine ever leading because it had so many God things on it. And suddenly, uh, that suddenly the Lord comes. It's June 1982. A prophet from Phoenix, Arizona comes uh, to St. Louis to visit a good friend of mine named Rick Shelton. And a man with a, prof a proven prophetic history, and he drives by the building of the church that I'm pastoring, and he hears the audible voice of the Lord. So he goes to a dear friend of mine, Rick, the church that he's uh, ministering at, and he says, Rick, do you know that building? And so and so he goes, yeah, that's my uh, good friend, Mike Bickle. He goes, I've heard the audible voice of the Lord. The Lord is about to make a major change in his life. He has no idea of it. He's going to ambush him and completely reorder his life. And so Rick called me on the phone. He said, Mike, 
you have to meet uh, this prophet. He goes, I don't know how to tell you because I've never, I didn't have any grid. This was the first uh, person I ever met that was called that. So I, I get with Augustine, make a long story short. And uh, Augustine says, I'm just going to be real straightforward with you. The Lord spoke to me audibly and you're about to have the change. You're going to have the right of your life. You're going to have a change. You can't imagine what is about to happen in your life in the days ahead. Of course, I couldn't feel what he was saying at all. I just looked at him and and uh, just I just had no sense for it. I, I didn't connect to it at all. And he said, I'm going to give you four words. And it came down to, I'm going to Kansas City. It's how it all ended up uh, with a few other dimensions of the story in, involved. There were a few others that contributed to that. And he said this, he goes, I have four words from the Lord. He says, number one word, he goes, thousands. He, he's told me this many times. He goes, multitudes. He goes, thousands. He says, thousands and thousands, multitudes. He told me, um, again, this story many times, of young people who are going to be gathered to Kansas City, to something in Kansas City. I'm in St. Louis at the time. I said, okay. He says, number two, he goes, there's going to be a full release of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He goes, I'm talking John 14, 12, greater works than these. Because I was at John G. Lake, you know, uh, real committed to John G. Lake. So that registered to me. He said, I'm talking about a full re release of the gifts of the Spirit. I remember saying John G. Lake. He goes, no, that's nothing. That's an introduction. John G. Lake never entered into the realm of greater works than these in any kind of consistency. He touched a few dynamic things, uh, but not with no consistency. He goes, third thing that's going to happen when the Lord sends you to Kansas City, he says, you're going to, uh, as these, uh, this thing begins to happen, he goes, a false prophet's going to be in your midst from the very beginning. He goes, and the next thing's going to happen, persecution will be birthed against you and the work that God has entrusted uh, to your leadership. And he says, and the Lord says, you're not supposed to answer it. I, the Lord, will take care of it. I will take it into my own hands. I will settle it. And he goes, uh, he gave me quite a bit on this. He goes, you are not to touch it. You're not to do anything with it, but leave it in God's hands. June 82 was uh, the first meeting with Augustine. Uh, September 82, I'm in Cairo, Egypt. And the Lord speaks, I'm going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity the earth in, in one generation. And tonight I, I want to add another part that the Lord made very clear that I didn't uh, take time for last night. I was uh, nearing uh, out of time. He said, there's four things the Lord told me in this experience, four things you must build this work on. Because the Lord says that he's going to start something in Kansas City and he told me it's going to touch the ends of the earth. And this Cairo, Egypt thing, I didn't mention that last night. He goes, I'm going to start something in Kansas City that will touch the ends of the earth in the glory of God. And, and I didn't mention that much in the early days because it seemed self-serving. But now it, it's the Lord has spoken up from so many prophets so many times for 20 years. I, it's just it's, it's false humility that only deserves the uh, title of a religious spirit and cowardly not to say what God has said. He has said it so many times. So. Uh, it, it would be false not to say that, but he told that I, but I was the first time I ever heard it about Kansas City. I heard it in Cairo, Egypt, and then I heard it. I've heard it from many prophets for 20 years over and over and over and over. And so I've always hesitated to say that back then, but he said, you're going to build this work on night and day, literal night and day prayer, literal night and day prayer. Number two, the work would be built on holiness of heart, which we call passion for Jesus, or we call the first commandment first, or the bridal paradigm, if you want. Because uh, passion for Jesus or holiness of heart flows out of uh, being fascinated out of an experience of intimacy of a God with a burning desire for his people. That's the kind of holiness we're talking about. He goes, the third thing this work will be built upon would be extravagant giving to the poor, Isaiah 58 that uh, the giving to the poor across the earth, he told me, not just the poor in America, not just the poor in our city, but that's where we'll start, although we've always sowed to places across the earth. But, but uh, he told me that he would give the wealth of the nations into our hands. He said this so powerfully, I will give the wealth of the nations into your hands if you will use it on the gospel and for the poor of the earth. And so that's, I made a covenant that night in my heart about finances that by the grace of God, I trust I've never backed off on, uh, uh, I hope, uh, not even one degree. It's been something that was a gift of God that was given to me in one hour. And uh, it was uh, so many years later, it was later, it was in the summer of 19, uh, no, it was in the summer of 2000. It was in the summer of 2000 when Paul Cain was uh, walking on Shiloh. He was walking on Shiloh. And I'm just going to be bold about this. 
I've only shared this to a couple of you behind the scenes, but he's walking on Shiloh, and he heard the voice of the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him, and it says it arrested his attention. He said, what is it to you if I make Kansas City a revival center that touches the earth? Paul says, I was startled. He says, the word of the Lord came so clearly, so powerful. It came from behind me. He goes, I heard it. What is it to you if I make Kansas City a revival center, not the only one, but a revival center that touches the earth? And Paul says, I stopped. And he goes, I turned around. And he said, in the fear of the Lord, the presence of God came on me. And, he's, and he says, I was perplexed. I thought, what a strange way to say that. And he says, I waited a moment or two and I didn't walk any further. I was by myself standing right there in front of the, the uh, recording studio. You can picture where it's at, right in front of the retreat center. And he says, and then the Lord spoke yet a second time. He goes, what's it to you if I give Mike Bickle $1 billion for the harvest? And Paul says, I... He says, I just stood there trembling. And Paul uh, called me the next, not that day. He said, the, just the weight of it. He called me, he says, Mike, he goes, you know, we think we know what's going on. He says, we don't really know. He said, the Lord, he didn't say he was going to do it. He asked me a question, but it sounds to me like he means he's going to do it. He goes, that's how I read that. And I said, Paul, the Lord made a covenant to me in Cairo, Egypt, one of the most holy things I've ever had, that he would release the wealth of the nations through this work as long as it touched the poor. It goes to the cause of the gospel to release warriors into their place. I have a vision to see a million intercessors, not all young people, but the vast majority of young people, and the scores of them getting a little bit of money. Uh, I don't mean of a million of them, but uh, all uh, that Kansas City is helping houses of prayer all over the earth and feeding the poor, etc., etc. And so anyway, the Lord said that. He says, I'm going to release the wealth of the nations. And uh, I have uh, four or five other very powerful times where the Lord has spoken to me about money. And he says, all you have to do is this, do with it what fills my heart. And that is the poor of the earth. And, uh, supernatural wealth beyond what you can comprehend will be released into this movement into Kansas City. I, I can't wait to get with Bob and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, the Lord's spoke it to you in 75, spoke it to me in Cairo, Egypt in 82, spoke it to Paul Cain in the summer of 2000, and many others as well. And then the next thing the Lord said is that he spoke about uh, prevailing faith. And what that meant to me, what I understood even in that day, was faith meaning the operation of the Holy Spirit in power. Faith for, for provision, faith for protection, faith for miracles, faith for direction. God, in the realm of faith, would release activity of the Holy Spirit beyond anything we could imagine. 1996, 1996, Paul Cain has a visitation from the Lord, and the Lord speaks to him the acronym IHOP. And that's why we named IHOP IHOP. Really, it was because of that experience Paul Cain had in 96. IHOP doesn't begin until 99. But in 96, the Lord visits him and says, I, intercession, H, holiness, O, offerings, extravagant offerings for the poor of the earth, and P, prophetic, or the realm of the Holy Spirit going forth in power. And I said, that works for me. That's the exact same things the Lord told me, exactly the same things. And so we began to use the acronym IHOP to talk about the four standards, the four values that God insisted on, insisted on. These values are not just to be amused at or looked at or analyzed or, or uh, all of those kinds of things. They're to be implanted into the heart of these Joel 2 forerunners. Beloved, night and day prayer is not a maybe thing. It is an absolute reality from the heart of a people. I'm not talking about even fulfilling a schedule. I'm not saying, well, we got 27 teams, we got 400 staff members, it's, the, the schedule's covered. The schedule covered is not exactly the same as the reality of night and day prayer burning in a community of people. I mean, we're going to have 5,000 people here one of these days. That's the word of the Lord. He told us that. That's, that's the beginning. It will be easy to fill the schedule five different prayer centers. It will be no problem to fill the schedule. That's not what the Lord was talking about, making sure the schedule's filled. He was talking about a people that lived in a spirit of prayer. A spirit of prayer, Joel 2 people. If we move, it's uh, November 1st and uh, ready to go. And the first thing we do is we begin nightly prayer meetings in November. And in uh, that first morning meeting, it wasn't the uh, first public meeting, but it was the first church meeting. We had about 50 of us gathered. The Lord interrupted us. It was a Holy Spirit meeting. It was one of the more powerful meetings we've had in 20 years. I thought every meeting was going to be that way. 
Because everybody was weeping, the spirit was moving, people were trembling. Not everybody, but I'm saying it was, it was just clothed in the grace of God relative to the experience I've had of meetings. And I've, I've seen a few good meetings over the years, not that many, but a few. And this was one of the best. And the Lord broke in, and I won't give the details, but he spoke Gideon. It was unplanned. He said, you are a Gideon people, and prophecy started flowing. People I've never seen, it just the spirit of prophecy just started happening over and over and over. And intercession began, nightly intercession began that night, which uh, by the grace of God, we did all those years at the church. And then IHOP started, we took the torch of the nightly prayer meetings, and beloved by the grace of God, to the best of my knowledge, unless I'm forgetting a, a night or two or something, the n meetings have gone every night since November 82. 82. They began that night at either a worship service with preaching, if you could call that a prayer meeting because of the worship would go for an hour, or just a prayer meeting in and of itself. It's gone every night, certainly in the high 90s, if not 100% of the night since then. I'm sure there, we've missed a few nights, but and it began that night. Our first public service on December 5th, 1982, I remember our, we had about 100 people that Sunday morning, and I turned Luke 18, night and day intercession for justice. Point two, Isaiah 62, he's going to set watchmen on the wall. Point number three, uh, what is it, uh, uh, the Anna one, Luke chapter 2, verse 37, Luke chapter 2. And uh, I began to talk about the vision of prayer. And I remember a guy come up to me. I became friends with him later. And he said, I didn't have a clue what you were talking about. And, and I said, you know, I wasn't talking to you. I wasn't casting the vision. I really wasn't. I was establishing my flag and banner in the spirit between God and angels and devils. That's what I was doing. I was hoisting a flag. I wasn't casting a vision. I said, it didn't matter to me if I rambled. I wanted to hoist a flag. I said, that's what I was really interested in. It was years later that Paul Cain, it, what was it, 99? He spoke this uh, very encouraging word uh, uh, to Floyd McClung, who took over uh, the, the, the uh, church that I'd pastored for 18 years, and he's been pastoring now and doing an excellent job. But it, Paul had a word for us. He said, from the beginning, when the Lord sent Mike to Kansas City, he goes, the gathering of people. From the very beginning, he says, it always was, it always was in God's heart, a prayer laboratory. It was never, ever a local church. It was always a prayer lab in the Holy Spirit. And I thought that was a, 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 an interesting, uh, uh, holy, I considered a Holy Spirit commentary on those 18 years. It wasn't only a prayer lab, but it was mostly a prayer lab. Okay, so I'm in, Saint Lu I'm in uh, Kansas City. We're going night and day. We've launched it. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm so used to saying night and day. That I, we were not going night and day. We were going every evening in prayer, 7 to 10 every night. And uh, a man comes to me. <clears throat> in uh, January 83, and he says, I want to tell you about a prophet who wants to meet you. And remember this uh, prophet from Phoenix named Augustine, who has now uh, since uh, gone to be with the Lord. He went to be with the Lord on August 8th, 1996. Uh, remember this uh, prophetic man, Augustine, said that a false prophet would be in your midst from the very beginning. And so uh, this older gentleman says, I got this man named Bob Jones. He wants to meet you. And I said, I don't want to meet him. It was in January, and I didn't tell the older uh, gentleman why. I just said, I don't want to meet him. But uh, it ends up, it's, May 7, it's, it's uh, uh, March 7th, and I'm meeting him. So uh, this guy prevails upon me, asked me a number of times. I go, okay, I'll do it. And I remember this day very, very clearly. It was a day that my life changed entirely. It was a day, it was one of those days where you look back and there was a line in the sand, and everything changed after that day. And uh, what Augustine's word was in, back in June 82, because now it's March 83, was you're going to go on a change, a journey. You can't even imagine where this thing is going. So it's March 7th. I remember uh, it was warm. It had been warm, unseasonably warm for a week or two. I don't know how long, but I know I had a short sleeve shirt on, and it's March 7th. Typically, you know, it's a little chilly on March 7th, and, but it's March 7th, and it's unseasonably warm. At least it seems that way to me. i got a short sleeve shirt on. I don't know uh, what it was, but this man walks in with a winter coat on. And that's what strikes me. And I have a short sleeve shirt, and I'm going, I, he walked in. 
And, uh, and, and I remember he was just so, he was so gripped. He was so emotional. I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen him this emotional, but besides this, this day. And uh, the reason he was so emotional, and I'm, again, I'm just going to be straightforward about it because it's so many years ago and, and a whole lot of people know this. I don't know that I've ever just put it on tape real clear. But uh, he had had a one, he says 100, that's not a scientific number. He means many. Since 1975, it's now 1983, so how many years is that? Eight years? Eight years, he says, I must have had 100 visions and uh, encounters with the Lord about meeting a 27-year-old young man in the spring of 1983. I was 27 in the spring of 1983, but he had known that for some time. And, uh, and he... And, and, you know, so he's choked up. Uh, I mean, he's not crying, but he's, he's emotional. He's, he's obviously emotional, observably emotional is what I'm trying to say. And I went and met one of Bob's pastors after uh, a month or two later at the church that Bob had been at it for a number of years. I said, do you know Bob Jones? He goes, yeah. I go, what do you think about him? He goes, he's a true prophet of God. I said, oh, I says, you know, he's at the new congregation I started. He said, yeah, and he gave me the shock of my life. He said, he told us that a 27-year-old man was coming in the spring of 83, and when he came, he had to leave. And uh, he goes, I believe it. He goes, I'm behind you 100%. He goes, go for it. He says, I always knew that he was with us temporarily anyway. I said, he really said that to you? I said, because, you know, I wasn't sure if he kind of, his memory got a little faint, you know, in the hour, and he kind of added a few details to it, because I just had met him. He says, yes, he had told us this for a number of years. This was going to happen. I was going, man, what is going on? I would, you know, that was unnerving. That probably had more impact on me than anything, just that pastor saying that. So anyway, we're going, that was a couple of months after March, but we're going back to March. It's, and so Bob walks in. He's got his coat on. I put my hand out. He's observably emotional. Uh, I mean, not weeping or anything, but gripped. And I put my hand out. He doesn't shake my hand. I just said, hello, my name's Mike Bickle. And he's looking around the room, and he says, at the first of spring when the snow melts, they will sit around a table, the communion table, the fellowship table, and they will accept me. And I said, my name is Mike Bickle. I said, can I take your coat? And he was so serious. He was so serious. There were only three of us in the room, and it was embarrassing a little bit. He was so focused. He said, I said, can I take your coat? He said, in the first of spring, when the snow melts, he goes, listen to me, this is very, very important. He says, they'll sit around the table, the communion table, and they will accept me with their own words. And I said, okay. I said, well, who, who, who will accept you? He said, he stared at me, he goes, you will. And I knew in my mind he was the false prophet then. <laughs> I really did. I said, he said, here's my number. You're going to need it. He wrote it down. He goes, please put it in your pocket. You're going to need this number. Of course, I didn't think I would, but then he goes, uh, do you understand the principle in Acts chapter 2, verse 17? That's the passage we're looking at now. And I said, no, I can't say that I do. He says, let me tell you something. You're going to need to understand this. He goes, because the Lord told me, he's told me many things. He goes, I've had over 100 visions about you, young man. And he said, uh, the Lord told me that you were very inexperienced in the things of the Spirit, but he would train you and I would be here to help. And he says, there's things that are going to happen. And he gave me the August 7th, 1975 encounter with the angel and maybe 50 of the visions in the next couple hours. (laughs) I was so overwhelmed. And uh, he says, uh, the Lord told me you were inexperienced in the things of the Spirit, but he's going to train you, and I'm here to train you, and others are going to come. And he said, but this is going to be a very important verse to you because the Lord has spoken Joel 2 over and over and over through the years. So uh, he says, look at uh, the dreams and visions, verse 17. I says, I'm a little familiar with that. I says, I understand that principle. He goes, that's not the principle. He says, the principle is in verse 19. He says, I'm going to show signs uh, in the heavens and wonders on the earth. He goes, God's going to give a vision in verse 17. And the vision is open to anybody's interpretation. Or the vision could be false. The vision could be a man's imagination. How will you know? He goes, how will you know if the vision is of God or not? I'm looking at this guy and I go, I don't know. He says, the Lord told me you would be very inexperienced. He goes, I'm teaching you how you'll know. He says, there are visions that God cares so much about 
that the people would know them and believe them, that the prophet will give the vision, and then God will back the vision up by a sign in the heaven that no man can manipulate. He goes, that's what that verse means. He goes, did you know that? I said, no. He goes, I'm going to give you a vision. I said, okay. He says, here's the vision. And he says, I know you'll misunderstand it. And I was misunderstanding at that moment. He goes, you're going to accept me as a prophet of God in your midst. And the things I've seen for these last eight years, these hundred visions, again, it's not an actual number. I'm sure it was 30, 40, 50, 60, some large number. He says, you're going to have a chance to understand them, and God's going to send a sign in the heavens. He goes, you know why? He goes, you know why he sends a sign in the heaven? Because no man can manipulate it. He says, in the first of spring, the snows will melt, and I will be around your table, and you will accept me. And then you will know the vision is real that I've told you, that I've been sent to teach you and to prepare you for a worldwide move in Kansas City that you're totally unprepared for. And I said, okay, okay. He says, so keep my number, please. He was very polite. He, he really was. He says, let me tell you what's happening. God's, there's a banner over this city. He goes, if you want to know the truth, it's over a 500-mile radius of Kansas City. It's called prophetic at intercession. He goes, God's going to raise up out of prayer warriors and prophets a house of friends. It was on that day that Bob gave us the phrase, the house of friends. He says he's going to fill the stadiums. He's going to fill Arrowhead Stadium. And he says he's going to anoint the prophetic singers first. He goes, it's going to be young people. He says, he says it's going to be all ages. Because God's going to join the generations, but there's going to be an army of young people. And he goes, and let me tell you something you may not understand. He goes, God's doing this for the glory of his son, but it's going to impact the nation of Israel. He says, God is going to raise up a mighty church in Israel, but you in the Midwest, not just Kansas City, but he goes in Kansas City, you're going to impact it in a very dynamic way. He began to tell me about Harry S. Truman. He says, God's going to set you next to Harry S. Truman. I'm going to Harry S. Truman. I mean, only as far as I went back was Kennedy. I go, I don't really know Truman that much, to be honest. He goes, he goes, Harry S. Truman was the intercessor for Israel. just did it politically. He didn't even fully understand what he was doing. God's going to set you next to him. And he went to explain it. And I mentioned it the other day, and I'll mention it more in the days to come. And, you know, because we're in Overland Park. He says his, ho his house is in Grandview. And as you know, we ended up with a building a couple hundred yards from the house he grew up in. And when we went there, Bob said, I told you that was going to happen. Because what he did politically, this prophetic house of friends, he called it a house of friends under the unction of prophetic and intercession, is going to impact Israel even more dynamically, far more than Harry Truman did. And he went on to explain that. And it was just, again, I'm just, uh, just a little bit... Uh, Deal. He says, the Lord told me you'd be 27, you'd come in the spring of 83, you'd be preaching on revival and intercession. He says, my friend tells me that's your message. The, the old elderly gentleman, I said, that is my message. He goes, are you 27? I said, I am. He goes, this is the spring of 83 and this is the Lord. And I said, again, I, I wasn't, I, it was just strange. I couldn't, I couldn't understand. He goes, now, let me tell you a little bit about who you are. He goes, do you know who you are? And I said, I'm not sure what you mean. And, you know, I, I joke about it later, but it wasn't funny then. It was intense. It was odd. It was dramatic. It was respectful. Bob was very kind and respectful. It was, you know, and sometimes I tell the story and put the humor in it because it's funny in retrospect, but in the moment it wasn't. It was like, what is going on? He says, do you know who you are? And I didn't know what he meant. I said, I I'm not sure. He said, I don't think you know who you are. He says, number one, you're, you're an intercessor. He goes, I think you know that. I go, I do know that. I said, the Lord told me that in May of 79. He goes, I thought you would know that. He goes, did you know you're an evangelist? I go, I love evangelism, but I'm bad at it, so I don't do it very much. But I, I have pain over it. He goes, no, no, you're an evangelist. He goes, you're an evangelist under the prophetic anointing with signs and wonders. You'll be in the stadium. He goes, there's a whole company of young people that are evangelists with the prophetic anointing and signs and wonders. I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, I didn't think you knew that. He said, you're a youth pastor. Then I said, well, really, I, I've, you know, I've been a senior pastor now for uh, seven years in St. Louis. And he said, no, no, no. He goes, I'm not talking about what you're doing now. He goes, it's years down the road. He goes, you're a youth pastor. 
He goes, you'll be one of the oldest men in the movement. I said, how many years from now? He goes, I don't know, but the Lord showed me you'd be one of the oldest. You won't be the oldest. You'll be one of the oldest. He goes, you're a youth pastor. It's a worldwide youth movement. He goes, they're going to prophesy. They're going to intercede. They're going to fill stadiums. He said, they're going to do signs and wonders. He said, this is where this thing is going. I said, a youth pastor. I said, I don't understand that because you don't have to understand it. So uh, the time is over. And he told me so many more things. He says, I'm going. He stops at the door. I can picture it right now. No, I remember saying about the coat. He sat there the whole couple hours. I mean, it went hours. I don't know how many I go. Uh, You're not taking the coat off. He goes, no. He goes, it's going to snow. I said, but Bob, I think the winter's done. It's been warm for some time now. He goes, no, it's going to snow on the first of spring. I'm keeping the coat on. He goes, us prophet guys are strange, I know, but just let me keep the coat on. It's important to me. I said, okay. But that so struck me. And maybe if he didn't have the coat on, I wouldn't have caught, we wouldn't have had the dialogue about the first of spring, and that was the critical statement. So then he's, I can see his, him going out the door. I can picture him so clear. He puts his hand on the door. He turns around. He says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. I almost forgot. He goes, four things. He goes, the Lord told me you like it. One, two, three, four, don't you? I said, well, yeah, I do. He says, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four. He goes, I don't really much like that style, but I'm going to do it just for you. But uh, he goes, let me tell you. He goes, the Lord said you'd understand this. Number one, he goes, there's thousands of young people that are going to come to Kansas City or be gathered together in Kansas City. Some are from, some are from who knows where. And he said, thousands are going to be gathered in Kansas City. He goes, number two, he goes, the Lord's going to release the full gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says, even greater works than these. He goes, number three, be careful. There'll be a false prophet in your midst from the beginning. He said, but I'm here to help you. And he goes, and number four, he goes, oh man, he goes, there's going to be trouble when this thing gets off the ground. He said, trouble, trouble, trouble. But the Lord says, he'll see you through it. He says, I got to go now. And those were the four things that Augustine told me, uh, you know, nearly nine months earlier, the, the prophet from, from uh, uh, Arizona And I heard those four things, and I went, oh, my goodness. So uh, a couple weeks go by. I don't talk to him. I don't don't really know what to do with that. Someone says, did you believe him? No, not really. Did you not not believe him? I didn't know. It was so strange. I just stared and didn't tell anybody but Diane. I went home. I said, Diane, I met the strangest. I had the strangest experience is what I told her. The strangest experience you can imagine. She goes, tell me about it. I go, impossible to tell you. <laughs> impossible. She goes, well, try. I go, impossible. <laughs> then after she got to know Bob well, she goes, no, I understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and so now a couple weeks go by, and there's this uh, 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 fearless holiness preacher that comes in town named Mark Katz. And some of you know that name, this fierce Fierce and fearless holiness preacher. And uh, I went and heard him at a full gospel businessman meeting and on a Saturday. And then he heard there was this church praying every night. So however, you know, from November to March, five months, whatever. And uh, he went to go check it out. So he came and he was sitting on the back row and he was intimidating. You know, there it is that Sunday morning. There's Art Katz sitting there. This, uh, uh, at, at the end of it, the meeting is over and we're praying for the sick. And, uh, and they're praying in the prayer line and I see Bob Jones. I haven't really talked to him much, just barely, just one time for a, a couple of moments. And, uh, he's talking to our cats and our cats is writing down stuff. And, and I, and I'm just preoccupied by what are that's going on. So afterwards I said, what, what, what was it? He goes, this guy's a prophet of God. I said, Really? He goes, unbelievable. He goes, I had a dream from the Lord. He told me about my dream and interpreted it is stunning what has just happened. He goes, do you know him? I go, I met him. He goes, take him very seriously. I go, really? (laughs) You know, I was 27. Art was maybe 55 and it had a lot more experience. And I go, really? He goes, absolutely. So now uh, Art's in a little two-passenger airplane and he's going to fly out and and the weather gets bad. And so it ends up... uh, uh, later on, uh, he, they determine they can't get out. And so he says, Hey, 
what's the chance of calling that white-haired gentleman? I'm going to be here tomorrow morning anyway. I'd love to meet him for an hour, just even. I said, okay. So I said, oh, I got his phone number in my wallet. I pulled it. I said, I got it. I called Bob. I said, this is Mike Bickle. I said, uh, the young man from the church. He goes, oh, no, I know. I've, I've, I've been waiting. I've been waiting all day for you. And I, and I actually said this. You know, I wasn't quite on the personal level with him yet, but I said, you got your coat on? He goes, yes, I do. <laughs> I did ask him that. I slipped that one in a little ahead of time. <laughs> you know, a couple of meetings later, we loosened up. But uh, he said, I've been waiting for you all day. He goes, I'm actually a little surprised you called. He goes, I thought Art would have called. He goes, the burden was on Art. And so... Uh, he says, I'll come right over. Where do you live? And so he came over about 9 o'clock at night because it was just a kind of a last hour call. And, and uh, Diane had some stuff out on the table. And there's a handful of us, maybe six, seven, eight of us sitting there, maybe six, seven of us. And we go from 9 or approximately 9 in the evening till 4 in the morning. Four times in that period of time, four times the whole company of six or seven, we wept, all of us, spun simultaneously. A spirit of weeping hit four times, and we were there till four in the morning. And then uh, Art says, he tells Art a few more secrets of Art's heart, and he goes, Bob, you are a prophet of God. I don't, I don't care. Then Bob says, well, and he looks at me, and he says, I guess this is a, uh, this is what I came here for. And he told me a dream. And I won't give the details because this is so uh, personal and emotional to me. But I had made a covenant with my father. I only made one covenant in my whole life besides with my wife. And the covenant with my father was, was just months before he suddenly died of a heart attack. And I didn't know he was going to die. He did. He had a terminal heart disease. But he didn't tell. We have seven kids in our family. He didn't tell any of us. And he had me make a covenant with him about something very, very important because my brother had just broken his neck. And he says, you got five sisters. You're, you're the only brother. And he, da, 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 da. And so, and, and uh, he said, I'm asking you to make a covenant before God. And I said, you know, he said, make a covenant with your God. And I said this particular sentence to my father. Never told my brother, never told my sisters, never told my mother, never told my wife the sentence. And Bob Jones says, an angel visited me last night, and he told me this and gave me this sentence. And I just began to sob. And every, the whole room did. And I looked up and I said, you are a prophet of God. And Bob says, uh, why, why are we sitting here right now tonight? And I said, and it ends up, fast forward, just to say, redeem the time here. He says, tonight. It's March 21st. It's the first, sp first day of spring. Why didn't Art fly out? The snow came in today. He goes, look outside. I looked out there. It's melting. He says, the first of spring when the snow melts. He goes, we're around the communion table fellowshipping, and you've accepted me with your own words just now. I told you you would. <laughs> yeah, it's, re it's really funny now and cute, but it was in it, the whole room started just weeping again. It was so intense. And then, you know, the thing lifts, you know, we kind of recoup. And I said, tell me all that stuff you told me a couple weeks ago. And I said, how did you know the snow would come? How did you? It was so warm. He said, the Lord told me in a dream. He said, that was a sign. Now will you believe the vision I gave you? He goes, the sign was, he goes, no man can make the weather patterns come and go. He goes, if you think this is something, he goes, you're going to see this many times. And we have seen it uh, over the years, maybe 10 times. And 10 is a lot if you've never seen it once. But he told me this. He goes, you're going to see this a lot more. But in the days to come, this is going to be so regular and the signs will become increasingly spectacular. I mean, picking a weather pattern in, in advance is pretty outstanding when it's that precise. Nobody can manipulate a weather pattern, and that's why the signs are there, because they're out of the reach of human manipulation. Maybe a, a, a healing is a fake healing, but you can't... Uh, Joel said, signs in the heavens, things that attest... They will attest to the prophetic accuracy of what's going on. That's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons. He says, you're going to see this many times. And, and I have a, a list, and as, I've, you know, as I look at all these prophetic history in 20 years, I think maybe the number's 10 or 12 times where God spoke 
uh, months ahead of time often, weeks or months, and exactly on that day it happened, exactly. He said, uh, this was only to get your attention. He goes, that's why I was wearing the coat. He goes, remember? He says, if it wasn't for the coat, you probably wouldn't even have paid attention to me. And I said, I probably wouldn't have, to be honest. I probably wouldn't have. And so uh, a couple weeks go by now. That, that, that was on May 7th. I mean, uh, March 7th was the first meeting. March 21st, there it is. I wake up the next morning with a new lease on life. I go, what if this stuff is true? I wasn't ready to go all that way, but I was definitely, definitely listening. And that night, Bob said, I told you, he says, you're a youth pastor. He goes, you're going to see it happen. It's going to be under the banner of prophetic and intercession. It's going to touch the whole world. You wait and see. I said, youth pastor. He says, you'll be one of the oldest ones. It won't be for a while. And I said, well, how old will I be? He goes, I don't know, but you'll be one of the oldest ones. He goes, he goes when the thing really explodes, it will be beyond my day. He goes, the Lord showed me I won't see it mature, but I'll see it begin. I go, how old will I be? He goes, I don't know, but you won't be young. <laughs> so now it's a couple weeks later. It's uh, nearly a month later. It's April 13th. It's on a Wednesday night prayer meeting. Remember, we're doing the prayer meetings every night because the Lord told us in Cairo, Egypt, do the prayer meetings. And so, uh, you know, that, 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 that was September 82. Now we're uh, April 83. Going every night and one night, suddenly, here it comes, the suddenly of God. The same clarity that I received in Cairo, Egypt. I've received this three, four times probably at this level in 30 years. The voice of the Lord comes to me. Suddenly, a, a routine prayer meeting. Here it is. And the Lord says, I'm going to summarize, because it's, it's a 10 or 15 minutes to give every detail, and I'm just going to give the point. The Lord says, I want you, bottom line, I'm just going to give you, the again, the summary of it. I want you to call a fast based on Daniel 9. I won't give the significance of Daniel 9. I will later. Daniel 9 is critical. Daniel 9 and Joel 2 are critical in all that we're about. It shows up year after year, time after time. Yet again, God speaks those two passages. He spoke Daniel 9 crystal clear call 21 days of fasting and prayer for the breakthrough etc etc Daniel 9 Daniel 9 is when the angel Gabriel comes and the angel Gabriel gives Daniel revelation at the end of the age and revelation at the end of the age is dynamically connected to fasting and prayer persistently I do not believe in any model of interpretation if that's a fair way that's not an accurate way to say it I don't believe in any approach to interpretation of end time events that is not birthed, birthed, and bathed in continual fasting and prayer. And all the books that are filling the market, I have one first question. I want to know if the people writing the books birthed and bathed their conclusions in these books in persistent fasting and prayer. That is the model of Scripture, and that's what Daniel 9, verse 20 to 23, makes abundantly clear. And so the Lord began to uh, speak that eschatology, understanding of the end times, does not come in the clarity that it needs to come to God's servants, those that are going to trumpet it, unless they live in that lifestyle. It is a critical part of eschatology. And I see all these strong positions from all these different points of view. And I have one question. How many of you have even a simple 10 years? It had to be 20 or 30. Five years of an ardent commitment to fasting and prayer before you wrote these books and bathed your conclusions in them. That's what I want to know. And I've never asked the question. I don't think I ever would ask the question. It would be perceived as arrogant. And it would be perceived as confronting. But it, it's, it, I don't feel that way. I feel passion about this and my passion isn't about who's done it wrong because it says in Daniel 12 that those books are sealed till the last times they're sealed anyway I mean, you can beat on that thing all day long with a sledgehammer and that that door is sealed shut till God opens it and it's opened in his timing in a context of continual fasting and prayer there's a sovereign timing there's an agency of angels and there's a human participation that is critical or those seals won't unlock and uh, they haven't really unlocked much, but I think we're in the hour globally. 
the where they're going to begin to unlock. And so my point isn't to make a point arrogantly of who's done it wrong. My point is to call another generation to believe in this approach to end times. And to where if you received your conclusions in a setting other than that, I ask you to suspend them, to hold them in doubt for a season till you can check in. Uh, not, I mean, till, till, till you can uh, invest your heart in five or ten years of fasting and prayer. Don't Take those conclusions as final. Hold them softly until you get to find out for yourself in the way that Daniel found out his revelation about these things. But I believe there's a whole other generation coming. And that's where my passion It's not to pick on yesterday. It's to aim uh, for the future. I don't believe there's, Paul Cain said it, I think, best. He said, the Lord hasn't said much about this yet. He said, but what he has said isn't listened to by almost anybody. That's a very, very important word. The Lord says the Lord isn't speaking that much about it yet. But what he has said is not hardly listened to by anybody. I thought that was a very profound uh, statement. So I don't think that we've lost valuable time in the 20th century on eschatology. I don't think that we would have uh, gained much ground when the hour, but I believe the hour is coming. But we've got to approach it in an entirely different way than just comparing uh, commentaries to each other and cut and paste prophesying, you know, kind of thing. Like take it from one email, put it with the other one, put them all together and come up with the end of the age final conclusions that you're willing to fight about. Like just how crazy is that? Daniel 9, the angel says Daniel 9, Gabriel, last days, revival, all these kinds of ideas. I am so overwhelmed. Again, now this is two times now. I heard, I heard this in Cairo, Egypt, nine months ago. I've had two encounters now where, I mean, I, that two's a lot. And I was thinking, what, I don't understand what's happening. And so I, tell, I go home, I tell Diane, well, she's at the prayer meeting. We drive home, we're talking about it, and I go, 21-day fast. She, you know, she mentioned we've only been in the city a few months, and, and uh, okay, let's do it. And the Lord told me 500, he would call 500 to it. And, you know, that's kind of a big number for just a little church that just started that nobody knows. So I go to Bob Jones. And the Lord told me 500, that he would call 500 to it. And I call Bob the next day. I go, Bob, ever since that night at my house when the snow came a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I need you. He goes, I, he goes more, probably more than you understand. I said, I, I need to hear from God right now. He said, that's okay. He says, I've already heard it. And I'm on the phone, I go, uh, no, no, I'm talking about something really serious. He goes, yeah, I know, I already heard it. And I look over, and Diane said, what did he say? I said, he said, he already heard it. I go, that's not possible. He says, come on over. So I asked two young men to go with me in the car, and we're driving over there. I said, I said, God spoke to me something last night, Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel, global outpouring of the Spirit, end-time revival, uh, revelation about the second coming of Christ. The, the eschatology, that's what that really means. That's the big word for it. I didn't use that word. And they said, what on earth are you talking about? And I said, I'm not asking you for counsel. I'm asking you to be a witness. These two guys, 18 years old, I'm going to tell you again. And I said it, oh, the whole drive over there, about 20 minutes. I went down, I said, Daniel 9, Gabriel, worldwide breakthrough, end of the age, da 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 and they just looked at me and they said, we don't even understand what you're talking about. So I, I went to Bob's house and sat down. And Bob says, well, I guess the way this is going to work is if you tell me first, you'll never believe it if I tell you. I said, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> he says, I think I have to tell you or you'll never believe it. I said, yeah. He said, well, he says, I've never had an experience of this level. He goes, this is beyond anything I've ever experienced. Never have I had anything of this level. I said, well, what? He says, the angel Gabriel visited me in a night vision. I saw him with my eyes. I've never seen such a thing. I mean, a high, uh, an angel like this. I've seen angels a number of times, but never this. And he stared at me. He said, give the young man Daniel chapter 9, and he will understand. And he said, I will gather 500 together for this. And Bob went on to understand that God was going to gather 500, Joel 2.15, to a solemn assembly. And so, uh, and the Lord told uh, Bob in this experience, 
through the angel. But uh, the Lord told him that a con- that a uh, that he would send a, a second sign. He goes, he goes. You know how the uh, snowstorm really? Uh, lur- I mean, not the snowstorm. The first the spring when the snow came, the sudden the sudden snow came. You know how that really got your attention? He goes, yeah. He says, what would I tell you if a comet would come across? Would come across the heavens, and uh, un- unknown by scientists. He says nobody has seen it. I'm not talking about, I looked at the almanac, and here it is. And if it happened to verify that the vision from Gabriel is true, that Daniel 9 is a true call that you're supposed to embrace, he says, what would you do? I said, uh, <clears throat> well, that would be marvelous. I mean, that's kind of like above and beyond what I was asking for. I mean, I had this internal voice of God, audible voice that was so powerful, and now you've, seen, you've told me exactly what I saw. I said, how, how could it be possible that I need something more? He says, you will need more. He goes, before it's over, you will doubt it yet again. I go, how could I? He says, you will. He goes, the, the human heart is, is mysterious. And so we gather together. I, I give the message called Blow the Trumpet in Zion. I base it on Joel 2.15. Joel 2.15, Daniel 9. There it is. We gather them. I don't even tell much of the story because, you know, our congregation is four months old. And, you know, they don't know me. I don't know them. I don't really know what's going on either. I, you know, I'm, I'm like really saying yes in my, in my heart and in front of Bob, but I'm not that sure I'm saying yes fully yet out there in the public eye, you know, I, this is kind of feeling powerful, but I wasn't quite ready to go on the line with this. I called the fast because, you know, I didn't give all the promises. I just called the fast. I figure fasting is good anyway. And so uh, the Lord uh, told Bob that 500 would come and a sign would come. We gather May 7th, 1983. May 7th, 1983, we gather. They, Bob comes with the newspaper. And here, here I have it here because I've had people contest it. And uh, th- this isn't the newspaper, but it was the newspapers all over the world. Here is uh, the article written by uh, the scientists from Harvard and the Smithsonian Center for uh, Astrophysics. So here's a magazine. I mean, here's the article. It's out of a scientific periodical written. It's in partnership with Harvard and Smith- Smithsonian Institute or Center for uh, Astrophysics. And the name of the comet, you can read it, is May's Surprise Comet. And it came for um, possibly, I'm forgetting the second I've read this over and over, maybe a seven or eight day period. But on May 7th, they have the pictures of it. And on May 7th, they photographed it. And the May 7th photo- photograph is here. It's the closest comet that came to America since 1770. It was a total surprise, and, and the point of this isn't that it came the closest in 1770. The fact that of all the scientific equipment in the Earth, nobody saw it. That's the startling part of the Harvard and the Smithsonian Institute scientists said, nobody saw it. How could it be? And it's in the, can, it's, I don't know what paper, uh, uh, several people actually had papers because Bob's friends were all excited about this because Bob tell, told everybody everything. And so they, they all came, man, with their newspapers. I mean, two or three of them. I mean, hundreds of them. But they had their, because they knew the comet was coming. And on May 7th, there it is in the paper. And it, it was stunning. And I, at the very first night, talking about boldness and energy, he shows me this. I go, this is God. You know, I'm coming out of the closet, man. I'm, this is God. <laughs> Bob says, you're, you're not, uh, you're not, you're, he says, you're not out of the woods yet. I said, how could I? I mean, I heard from God in the most staggering way. I've only heard of a level from God in, in a few years, you know, in the, since I've been saved 12 years. At this level, except for Cairo, Egypt, you tell me what I heard. And I told nobody but my wife and the two guys in the car. You told me exactly. You said a comet was coming. A comet came like the snow came. Nobody knew. How could I not believe? He said, you will yet disbelieve again, or you will be weary and you will have unbelief. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit right now.